The first thing we have to ask is what do fish need protection from? Uh, well, obviously, they need protection from other fish. Uh, they need protection from animals, um, uh, coons, uh, otter, especially otter, uh, which are becoming more prevalent in Indiana. Um, birds. Birds are a huge predator on fish. You don't think about that, but ask anyone who has uh, uh, put a couple hundred dollars into uh, uh, koi fish in their little fish pond in their garden in town. Um, how many of those have been taken by great blue herons that, that just fly in from nowhere and boom, fly off with a $25 fish. Um, there's uh, a, a couple videos on the, uh, in the uh, YouTube uh, section on uh, osprey and eagles catching fish. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, fishermen, obviously, are a, a predator of fish. We, a lot of people practice catch and release, but a lot of people also eat what they catch. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, you're not going to put a really big dent in the fish population. In fact, there are some places where uh, fisheries biologists ask you to keep what you catch uh, because it, it helps them kind of balancing out the, uh, the, the predator-prey ratios in, in certain bodies of water. Uh, fish take advantage of their surroundings for protection. And if you scan a body of water and see what features and, 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 and cover um, that body of water offers to fish, we can start to figure out where fish are. Whenever we're looking at a body of water, um, there are two things that, that should stand out to you. Uh, one is structure and the other is cover. Now structure is kind of geologic features, you know, the way the, the, the lake is, 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 uh, is, is shaped, uh, points that stick out, uh, bays that run into the shoreline, um, really flat areas of, of the um, uh, the bottom, uh, old stream bed, old stream beds that run through uh, the uh, reservoir are, are all examples of structures. These are physical things, inorganic things, and they're not going to change from year to year. Cover, on the other hand, is more organic. Uh, plants, vegetation, weed beds. Uh, Maybe a tree has fallen into the water and all the branches are creating a, uh, a, a structure for, for young uh, bait fish to, to hang out in and then uh, that attracts the larger fish, which attracts the larger fish, so on and so forth. Uh, at high water, uh, flooded timbers, you know, can, will provide cover for, for, for young bait fish. Um, these things don't necessarily last from year to year. You know, on a stream, you might have a, 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 a log, a tree that has fallen in uh, that's creating a wonderful structure uh, to hold fish. But next spring, the floods come and they wash that tree, you know, downstream and it's no longer there. Um, so th those are examples of cover. If we take a look at a, uh, a fishing map, we can see right here, uh, this is a, a long strand and a point uh, that sticks out into uh, Lake Monroe. This is the 446 causeway that crosses uh, the, uh, the lake that separates the west basin from the east basin. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a structure. Uh, you can see this long arm that comes up in through here. This is a, a structure. You can see the old stream bed running right through here. This is structure. If you look up here, you see this, this kind of shaded area. That's cover. These are actually lily pads, hydrangea plants, and it, it, it literally covers this entire arm uh, during the summer. There's a boat ramp right here, and there's one channel that's probably, I don't know, 15, 20 feet wide that is open out to the main body, but everything else in here 
is lily pads. It's absolutely beautiful whenever the, uh, uh, the, the, the flowers are in bloom, and it's also very, very good fishing. Uh, this is the close-up view of, uh, of, of this area. Um, you guys want a story? Okay, several years ago, this is uh, BC, before children, my wife and I were really into canoeing. I was working in the, the uh, uh, canoe industry, and we had some friends from Indianapolis, and they would come down and we would launch from Pine Grove here, and we'd paddle up through here and paddle over through here. And there's this really nice beach right along here that we would stop and have a, a little picnic uh, a dinner. And very often I would take my fly rod with me, and I would come down to this point, and right off that point right here was a stump of an old sycamore tree. This thing was probably at least four feet in diameter. I mean, it was huge. It was cut whenever they built the, 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 the reservoir back in the uh, 60s. And I would put on a, uh, a hare's ear nymph and would cast out to that stump and just let it sink. And it wouldn't get more than two, maybe three feet, and I would get a hit. And I was pulling the biggest bluegill that I had ever caught in my life from from there. Um, <clears throat> my my friends thought that I was catching the same fish over and over, but uh, it was just absolutely fantastic. And I took a whenever we got back into the boat, I paddled over and looked at that stump, and the sides was absolutely riddled with little cavities that had been been you know burrowed into uh, over the, the decades by insect larvae and it was just absolutely teeming with uh, uh, with food and when I got home I dug out the uh, map and I noticed right here was a riverbed and so what does this area was offering was a good source of food you know all the insects in that stump and then deep water there's all this water up through here is about four six feet deep uh, in fact right here you can see the eight foot contour line and so all this is shallow water and then that old stream bed drops down uh, eight ten maybe twelve feet in some uh, areas that deep water gives fish protection and so I found what they call a prime lie someplace that offers protection and food and it was absolutely fascinating <coughs> okay um, you're complaining that you don't have a pedometer uh, you don't know what the underwater um, lake bed uh, looks like um, just look around because in most cases the shape of the dry land around the lake is going to be the same as the land under the lake. So if we've got a, uh, a long sloping gradual shoreline right here that probably extends the same underwater. And if we take a look at the uh, back to our fishing map, uh, we can see right up here that here's the eight foot contour there's a little uh, ditch right up here at 10 feet but it stays eight feet all the way out till we intersect the old stream bed and if we look at this land right here it's a very gradual slope up to probably around here and then it starts to, to pick up um, uh, elevation um, if we see a really steep shoreline right above the water, there's a really good possibility that we're going to have a steep shoreline underwater. And again, if we go back to uh, this area, this is the boat ramp, cut right boat, boat ramp area, um, the causeway. And if you look right here, 
you can see that the land just drops off. There's the eight foot contour, but then we're down to 38 feet at the bottom of that stream bed. I mean, it literally just drops off. Um, and if you look at this area above land, it's almost a sheer cliff. There's about maybe a three or four foot shoreline right here that you can uh, park at the parking lot here and then walk out and, and fish that shoreline. But you are immediately right in to the, the, one of the deepest parts of the lake. So um, just because you're, you're bank bound, uh, you don't have a boat, or if you have a boat, you don't have a pedometer, uh, just use your eyes. Look around, because usually the, the contours of the surrounding shoreline are the same uh, underwater. But it's really important to locate those old riverbeds if you're fishing a reservoir. Okay, let's uh, talk about streams for a moment. <clears throat> streams are a little different from lakes and reservoirs. Um, they st the same basic things, um, but there's a, a few things different. Uh, also, if you are getting into uh, trout fishing, there are some terms that you're going to come across in literature that you may not be familiar with. Um, Freestone, Spring Creek, Limestone Creek, um, uh, tailwaters, uh, chalkstone, so on and so forth. Uh, here they are. You can uh, read them at your leisure. Uh, it's not going to be tested. I just kind of threw it out there uh, for, for more information. Oh, crap. Let's take a look streams. Uh, streams are a little different than lakes and reservoirs. Um, number one, the water is moving. And leave a comment down, uh, down below, which direction do you think the water is moving in this illustration? Clockwise, like this, or counterclockwise, like this? Let's talk about some of the features. We have an eddy right down here. Here you can see a rock, and as the water is traveling down like so, it hits this rock and splits. Right behind that rock is an area of low pressure. As the water speeds up to go around the rock, Bernoulli's principle, you may remember the fluid is going to create a low pressure behind that. This is a wonderful place for fish to hang out. You can see this fish sitting right here. He's facing up into the current and just waiting for some food to float by. Uh, it's, it's kind of like one of those, um, you know, at a, at a sushi restaurant where they have this conveyor belt that, that, that just brings it right by and you reach out and, and grab the, the plate and, and eat that sushi. Uh, exact same thing right here. Uh, this is also a wonderful place for um, uh, whitewater paddlers to hang out, uh, canoeists or or, or kayakers. They will use this low pressure here uh, right behind a rock to sit and catch their breath. The water is actually moving upstream at this point and so you can sit in an eddy literally all day. Those are called eddy flowers and um, uh, just watch the world go by. If we move up here we can see a deep area called a hole and particularly large fish like to dominate a hole. Very often you'll only find very large fish in a hole because smaller fish who go into the hole get eaten. And so if you can uh, target this, maybe drift a bait down in here very slowly, very naturally, oh boy, you can have a wonderful time. Uh, over here we have some down trees 
in the water that's creating um, an area for, for fish to hide, to seek protection from bigger fish, which of course attracts bigger fish, um, very well worth targeting. Up here we have a weed bed, that same thing in a lake, uh, will attract fish. Um, oftentimes a big fish will get in here and just kind of hang out waiting for smaller fish to kind of swim by for an easy lunch. Up here we have riffle, uh, ripples. Uh, ripples are really interesting because remember when we talked about um, birds and how birds prey upon fish? Birds have to be able to see the fish to prey upon the fish. So they're relying upon clear, flat water to see. But ripples is an area where the the stream bed suddenly starts to 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 rise decreasing the depth of the water right up here this could be two three four feet deep but then suddenly we get this shoal area that may be only two feet deep and what happens with that fluid that is flowing over this uh, this is just straight fluid dynamics or hydrodynamics to be more specific. Um, that energy of the water flowing down through this creek has to go someplace. Well, it goes vertical. There's a vertical displacement. And that displacement we call ripples. If they're really big, we call them waves or rapids. Um, these ripples, the rippling of the water breaks up the surface of the water, thereby making it difficult, if not impossible, for birds of prey to look down into the water and spot their next meal. Fish know this, and so you'll get fish holding in ripples, having the protection from aerial attack, and as this water scours the bottom, it picks up some of those uh, invertebrates, those nymphs, washes them up into the current and they float down in front of the fish. Uh, but now you've figured out that the uh, current in this stream is moving uh, clockwise in this direction. One of the, uh, the first giveaways, the first clues, is that the fish are facing upstream. fish in a current will almost always face upstream unless they're, they're traveling, you know, purposely downstream. But this way they can use their, their, their um, uh, tail fin, their caudal fin, to provide a little bit of forward uh, uh, motion, which is offset by the downstream current and so they literally can hold stationary in one position. That's what these guys over here in the ripples are doing. Uh, they're holding in one area uh, just waiting for a tasty morsel to uh, float down uh, past them. So um, we can also look at the type of bottom in the lake, reservoir, or or stream. Um, if we analyze the bottom type, we can have a pretty good guess of what type of food is, is there. Uh, silt. Um, silt is a kind of a sandy um, clay type bottom. Um, when you step in it, if you're waiting, you'll get this, this bloom of, of, of dark cloud, cloudy water. Um, that type of bottom is going to hold a certain type of uh, aquatic worms and, and other invertebrates. Muck is similar to silt, but where silt is, is more clay-based, muck is organic-based. Uh, how can you tell the difference between muck and silt? Oh, if you step in the muck, you will most definitely know it because it smells earthy, just 
earthy, rotting, gross, just you'll know when you're in the muck. Uh, vegetation we've talked about, um, you know, weed beds, how that uh, uh, holds invertebrates and minnows. Uh, a sandy bottom is uh, a kind of a, a dead giveaway for uh, uh, certain types of uh, invertebrates, uh, sandworms uh, per se, uh, and um, uh, usually if you have sand, you'll very almost certainly have gravel in some areas. Uh, gravel is a favorite uh, haunt of uh, crayfish and other invertebrates, uh, namely helgamites. And if you get into a stream that has kind of a combination of sand, gravel, and rock bottom, you will find helgamites. And if there are smallmouth in that stream, the smallmouth are just dreaming of the day that they can um, score some helgamites. And fly fishermen know this, and they tie uh, different patterns that imitate the helgamite. Helgamite is a is a an insect that looks kind of like a centipede, except they have these great big jaws. You know that uh, <clears throat> on one end. These, these pincers that if you're not careful, you know, whenever you're, you're threading them onto a hook or, or removing them from a, a, a bucket, you know, if, if those things latch onto you, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll just take your hand right off. I mean, they're, 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 they're horrible monsters. Uh, but smallmouth really, really like them. Um, rocky bottom, again, crayfish. <clears throat> that is just prime habitat uh, for crayfish. Uh, smallmouth, largemouth, uh, walleye, well, shoot, everything likes crayfish. Um, uh, minnows might be, or uh, bluegill might be a little intimidated. Um, you have to be a fairly decent sized bluegill to eat a crayfish, otherwise, the crayfish might eat you. <coughs> So, whenever you're out fishing, you want to be looking for changes, breaks in the, 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 the lake or the stream, uh, where one thing is transitioning into another. Uh, this image right here shows uh, various contour depths. You can see right up here, that's a hundred feet deep as opposed to 20 feet over here. You see each one of these contour lines. Um, when you're looking at a fishing map, uh, a chart, um, someplace on there it will show you uh, what the interval of contour lines are. It could be uh, 6 feet, um, 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever. It depends on the scale. So look for these changes. This is where you're going to find fish. So, where are you going to find fish? Well, there's some resources that are available to you. Uh, the internet is an absolutely fabulous tool. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, the Indiana DNR has a very good website that shows you different places to fish. Uh, Google, oh my gosh. You can do so much scouting with Google Maps. Uh, you can figure out what roads cross different streams at certain points. Um, you, you can go to satellite view and actually look at the stream and, and just gain tremendous amount of information. Uh, please don't overlook um, old-fashioned analog maps because they can um, <clears throat> be folded up and taken with you. Uh, the batteries never run out. You never have to worry about uh, uh, a cell phone signal. Um, they're always there. Uh, guidebooks, people who actually write about fishing in a particular area. If you're going to Colorado f to do some trout fishing, by all means, scope out some guidebooks. Um, there's years and decades of, of information crammed inside these things. Local bait sh shops. Most of these people are very interested in you buying bait. And if they can put you on fish, you're going to probably buy more bait from them. Um, <clears throat> you know, put forth some effort to establish a relationship with the, uh, the local bait shops. They can be a tremendous resource as uh, where to go, what to catch, how to catch it. And I'd also like to impress upon you the importance <clears throat> of local guides. Um, 
guides are a wealth of information. Yeah, they can be a little expensive depending on the area. Um, $200, $400, $600 for, for a half day, um, double that for a full day. But you will learn more fishing three hours with a guide than you will three years fishing by yourself. They are that knowledgeable of the area. Most of them are very willing uh, to share. The important thing about uh, using a guide is you need to tell them what you want to accomplish. If you want to get out of the office, not talk about work, not take emails, they will easily accommodate that. If you want to learn more about local fishing conditions, maybe new fishing techniques, tell them that and they can accommodate you. So that's all we have for um, uh, finding fish, and we will go into some more safety issues of fishing in the next lesson.